Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's Thursday, February 16th. Uh, beautiful day down here in Baltimore, Maryland. And today we got another repeat guest coming on. One of my research analysts, Drew McConnell. He's going to be joining us to talk about what we're working on right now. A new stock recommendation that just went out yesterday. And the sectors and trends we have that are on the top of our watch list. All coming up right now on Making Money. Last year, when most investors were watching their stocks plummet, one Wall Street legend had an unfair advantage that was identifying winning stocks with massive upside. Like Riot Blockchain, before it shot up 10,090%, Digital Turbine, before it shot up 789%, Overstock.com, before it shot up 1,050%. This power gauge comes from the legendary Mark Chaikin. Right now, you can get a free in-depth look at how his power gauge system works, a way to type in any 4,000 different tickers and see exactly where the stock is most likely to go next and in any type of market. Simply go to PowerGagePreview.com for a free look. Again, that's PowerGagePreview.com. Again, thanks for joining me. This is Matt McCall. It is the 16th of February, 2023. It is a nice Thursday down here in Baltimore. And as I mentioned, uh, one of my research analysts, uh, Drew McConnell, is joining us now. Drew, thank you so much for coming on the show again. Hey, Matt. Thanks for having me on again. Of course, of course. So we were in the office together last week, and uh, we had a few good hours of coming up with some ideas. Uh, and we'll talk about those in a minute, just to kind of share what we're kind of going to, you know, dive a bit deeper into and get, get you know, the, the point of the show for me, really, Drew, is to let people know like what we're doing behind the scenes. Sometimes they think, we're playing golf, doing things, and we don't do much of that. You know, we're really actually behind a computer, reading, writing, trying to come up with new ideas. So we had a pretty cool concept that we came up with a few months ago, and that was based off the energy sector. And what we came up with, and, and we didn't invent this, uh, you know, this has been out there a while, but it's called the barbell approach. So why don't you explain to people how we're using this barbell approach to uh, create a portfolio for the future of energy? Yeah, so the basic idea is to balance out the two sides of the barbell. So you've got a little bit of exposure on each side and so that you're balancing out your portfolio by not being only invested in one part of a trend. And so what we've done uh, is try to build out a little bit of exposure to your traditional, more what we are calling dirty energy. So your uh, oil and gas, um, even things like um, coal, but we don't have any investments in there right now. But, and then on the clean side of the barbell, you have your renewable energy like wind, solar, geothermal, and things of that nature. So by picking some stocks from each of those baskets, you can handle the volatility of investing in these sectors a little bit easier because you're not going to be only in one that could move very sharply for, you know, on news or on some kind of event. You'll be a little bit easier to handle the ups and downs of each of those sectors as they play out long term. So basically, we're not taking away a lot of the upside. But at the same time, we're taking away quite a bit of the risk of the downside. So That's essentially, right. your reward to risk ratio improves because your reward, again, may come down a little because you're not in that one single stock. But at the same time, because you're diversified not only between stocks, but in between two very different sectors, that risk drops dramatically, which is a better setup and really a better way to invest long term. And that's what we're trying to create when we create our portfolio. So we know um, obviously solar, we're going to talk about that in a minute and solar and renewable energy. We know the upsides and you have some great statistics for us, but why explain to people why we're going with what we call dirty energy, you know, your traditional, uh, fossil fuels, petroleum, if you will, if we believe that the future is renewables, why the hell are we going into a trend that looks to be dying potentially? I feel like people kind of think in, you know, that it's one or the other, that you have to, you have to be on one side of the lane or the other. And it's just not really the case. I mean, oil is woven into so many different parts of our economy and people think of it just as, you know, it's what goes in my car and I go and get gas and that's what it is. But obviously you've got natural gas to heat homes. Oil is used in a ton of other products like plastics and solvents and other industrial applications. And if you look at the demand for oil over the years, I think I wrote down that Last year, the demand for oil was about 100 million barrels per day worldwide. And this year, it's expected to go up to 102 million barrels per day. So 
if you look at a long-term chart of oil demand, it's going from the lower left to the upper right. It's just kind of steadily ticking up. And now there's a lot of other reasons to like oil and to like um, petroleum products in general, just because we've had years of low investment in the sector. And all these projects, they, they take a lot of time. It's not like you just write a big check and you know you get oil out immediately. It's year-long projects that have to be developed and planned for a long time in advance. And then when you look at what's been happening with the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which is a big domestic reserve for the U.S., it's been drained by about half since 2010. And most of that has happened in the past year. And that's caused prices to go down, but it's not sustainable forever. We can't you know, drain that to zero. Eventually, it's going to have to be refilled at some point. And We've heard, you know, different things and we've gone back and forth on this that maybe $70 a barrel, maybe somewhere around that area. And we've seen oil when it's come down to there, it's gone right back up. So that could be a good area to be looking at oil. But longer term, demand is going higher and investments been very low and drilling activity is very low. So there's a lot of reasons to like oil and oil names going higher as well as renewable names going higher. Yeah. And you make a good point that, you know, people probably don't realize, but and it's only a 2% gain, but going from 100 to 102 million barrels, um, million barrels per day, it's still increasing. And you, you would think mm -hmm. because of all the, the solar projects and wind projects and hydro and everything else, uh, geothermal, that you would have a really decreased demand for uh, fossil fuels, oil in particular. Also, if you read the headlines, they talk about the economy slowing down and how things, uh, potential recession looming. You would think demand would be less for it then. With inflation higher, people would demand less of it, less goods, less services, which use fossil fuels. But again, it keeps going up. And, and I think the one area, Drew, and you can expand on this, is if we are going to build out solar, and we'll get into solar and wind in a moment, but solar made up last year about 3% of all the energy um, that was produced in the United States, only 3%. Hmm. Um, that's a small number. You probably think People probably think it's much more. Only 3% of that. If we want to get up to, let's say, 30% at some point in the next two decades, that's a 10Xer. It costs a lot of money to build these facilities out. It costs a lot of money to build these offshore wind uh, turbines they're talking about. And Drew, where does that come from? Fossil fuels are used to build this stuff. So we may get there, but it's going to take decades to get there. And to build it, they cannot build it without fossil fuels without dirty energy. So talk about that a little bit, like the demand that we're seeing in this transition and how long that's going to take. I mean, in my view, we're talking decades still because you just, there's going to be massive investment into renewables and it's already happening right now. We write about it all the time. We talk about it all the time. But yeah, as you said, if you want to build any of these projects, <laughs> you need bulldozers, you need ships, you need all kinds of things that run on diesel or other forms of petroleum products. And so it, they both go hand in hand. And I think that a lot of people don't really see it that way, but it, it really is that we're going to need a lot more of these products in order to get to the renewable energy future. That is what's being laid out. So if we want to expand solar and wind and everything else, we also need to expand oil and gas production. Um, and in terms of, you know, forecasts right now that people are saying demand could fall and, it's possible, of course, you know, anything could happen, but with China reopening and with the other variables that I talked about earlier, it looks like demand is going to tick up most likely. Yeah. And, and you know, I'm just looking right now at, at the breakdown from the National Renewable Energy Lab, and it talks about what goes into making a wind turbine. And if you look at wind turbine growth, especially offshore, and especially here in, in North America, we're going to see a huge uptick uh, in that. And these are massive, massive wind turbines. About 67 to 79%, so about two-thirds, three-quarters of the turbine mass uh, is made of steel. Mm -hmm. To make steel, there's a lot of petroleum and stuff that goes into that. Uh, fiberglass, resin, and plastic, as you talked about, a lot of natural gas petroleum goes into making resin, plastic, and fiberglass. That's about 16% of it. Then you have iron, cast iron, you have copper, aluminum. A lot of this, to, 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 to create these, you have to use a lot of fossil fuels to do that. So I'm not saying, you know, that we're not going to get to a place where solar is a large portion of our uh, energy source or that wind's not a large portion of it. But that transition, you just mentioned, could take decades. And along that way, 
because demand, or sorry, because investment in oil and gas has been low recently. You cannot just turn a spigot on, as you mentioned earlier, and start bringing it out of the ground. So yeah, if no, demand I mean, stays high, that supply won't be there. We still have the issue with uh, Ukraine and, and Russia, obviously, big suppliers of, of fossil fuels. We have fossil fuels coming from the Middle East. Who knows what the hell happens over there? Not really friendly with us right now or haven't been for a long time. So there's these other issues that could really push up the price of oil, which would push up the dirty energy stocks. So how do you see this playing out? I mean, is, is do you consider the energy sector, the stocks right now, a core holding for most people in their portfolio? I mean, I think it should be at least part. You should have some exposure to this. And I think you should at least have exposure to both sides of it. As we said, you know, that's why we've implemented this energy barbell to have a little bit of each part of it. And as you were just saying, you know, if when you look at what goes into EVs, wind turbines, solar panels, all the components, you need to mine a tremendous amount of copper. Uh, we had talked about graphite is a big part of EVs. Uh, there's a lot of different minerals that you need, which the only way to get them out of the ground is to dig them up. And so you're going to have a huge commodity demand for these trends to be able to succeed. And I mean, I don't know if people are really expecting that or understanding how much we're going to need of all these minerals. And, you know, another part that we've talked about at length is rare earth metals. And, you know, there are huge parts of EVs and wind turbines and these magnets that they use for the different technology are very important. And so that's also got to be mined out of the ground. So all of this kind of paints a picture that you want to have a little bit in each. <laughs> yeah, you got you got to be diversified. I mean, I, I agree 100. percent And you know, I, I I think we said something this, this past week. I think I turned around and said to you and and Nick, one of our other researchers, and said, you know, we actually have a pretty good problem right now. We have too many good ideas because there's so many different ways to play the innovation, the trends that are happening in the next five, ten, fifteen, twenty years. And you often don't think of, of myself or, or what we do with my franchise as commodity people. They think innovation technology. However, there is no innovation without commodities. It just is not happening from rare earths to, to copper to aluminum. Graphite, you know, I want to touch on that for a moment because we were looking at the breakdown uh, last Thursday. You know, Drew, you and I were looking at this breakdown and the number one, as far as uh, weight, as far as kilograms are concerned, and the number one, the largest um, mineral or material that goes into electric vehicle is graphite. And that's yeah. not something we hear about very often. And there's not a lot of really big firms out there in it. We found a couple. We're not going to share that here, but we found a couple that have some good exposure to it. And considering those, we'll, you know, we're going to do some research, maybe even recommend them at some point in the future to our subscribers. But Again, I, th I think the way that we're going about this and thinking outside the box that, yes, there will be more EVs, but what are the other ways to play it versus just a charging station versus just the EV company itself? And yeah, I found it funny uh, this past week, we had a Super Bowl and there was a lot of EV commercials. You know, last year was all crypto. This year is all electric vehicles. Yeah. And um, <laughs> they're kind of like these hippie dippy commercials, like they're literally saving the world by plugging in. I think what they forgot to tell people is when they plug it in, that power is still probably coming from fossil fuels in some way. It's not like we're getting it from the sun that right now because solar only makes that 3% of the energy it's produced in the United States. So again, your EV, that's great, but you're still relying on powering that with dirty energy. And yeah, that exactly. EV is made from a lot of dirty stuff, graphite, et cetera. So um, I, I think we're, what we're doing right here is we're creating such great opportunity for our subscribers, investors, because we were thinking outside the box and you could still gain exposure to the EV trend. You can still gain exposure to renewable energy trend, but maybe let's think outside the box and not just do traditional buying, you know, a solar stock, buying a wind stock and buying an EV. What else goes into it? As we like to call it the picks and shovels. So talk a little bit though about the solar industry. You did a lot of research on this in the last couple of weeks, throw out some numbers of people, just let them know the potential growth. Cause we don't want to Overlook solar as well because we, you know, we like the dirty aspect, but we love the clean aspect as well. Tell them what what to expect in the next, you know, decade or so. Yeah, no, I should be. Yeah, we should be clear. I mean, we're still very bullish on renewables and solar in particular. The amount of money that's pouring into the sector is incredible. And so, if we look at this year, it's estimated that we're going to install about fifty five gigawatts of uh, electrical power generation capacity in the U.S. 
So a gigawatt can power about 750,000 homes, just to give you an, a rough idea. And more than half of that new capacity is going to come from solar power. So about 29 gigawatts. And these are huge, huge numbers. Um, right now, as you said, that 3% of the power is from solar, but by 2035, that should go up to about 14%. And by 2050, the IEA is as much as the International Energy Agency, they make a forecast for this and it should be up to about 20%. So right there, I mean, it's huge growth from 3% to 20% of power generation. Um, you can also see that the big driver for this is because solar panel costs have come down so much. So since 2010, the cost of solar panel has dropped by almost 80%. And so we're starting to get to that point where you're getting closer to equilibrium between the different prices of installing solar or keeping your current system with natural gas or however else you're powering your home. And EVs are kind of also reaching that tipping point. We talked about that a little bit last week that the cost of EVs is getting closer and closer to what buying an internal combustion engine car. And once you get to that level playing field, adoption increases. And so we're getting a lot of lower expense, sorry, we're lowering expenses for solar. And then we're also having a tremendous amount of money being poured into the sector. And since the Inflation Reduction Act was passed uh, just last year, they're saying that now we're gonna have probably $400 billion of additional investment in the solar in the next 10 years. And so it's gonna be about 200 billion, now it's gonna be about 600 billion. And so huge amount of cash. Um, and one other thing I would mention just for solar is that also included in that act, it extended the investment tax credit, which is basically a 30% tax credit for any new solar project. That was gonna be phased out starting next year. Now that's gonna be pushed out to 2032. So people that are building these new big solar farms, which there are a lot of, they're still going to be able to take advantage of that tax credit moving forward. So there's just a lot of a lot of things that are very bullish for the, the industry right now. So we got a lot of tailwinds, if you will, not to be too, you know, pun intended when it comes to like wind and everything. But we, we have some tailwinds, uh, which is great. And if you take a look at just performance of that sector, the solar sector in particular, over the last 12 months, the Invesco solar ETF, which is simple TAN, T-A-N, mm -hmm. uh, is up about 21 percent in the last year. Whereas the S and P down about six percent, um, and then there's a First Trust Global Wind Energy ETF symbol FAN. I mean, they're really great with these names, up about one percent. So both have really outperformed, but solar has really outperformed. And when we talk about this barbell approach, and you take a look again, let's throw it to last year. We take solar up twenty one and change. Then we take the XLE, which is the energy sector ETF, up thirty three and a half. Cut that in half, you're looking at about, what, 27, 28% or so uh, average. You're 50, 50 into that little barbell portfolio versus the S&P down 6%. So you could have taken two completely different sectors as far as most investors are concerned. They're either investing in dirty energy or clean energy. There's no outside, of, you know, they, they can't think that way. Where we're taking the exact opposite approach and saying, listen, we love, we love solar and, and wind and renewables. There's money going into it. The trend, it, it, you can't fight it. It's going to happen. And certain companies will do well. We've seen that. But we cannot get there without this. So why not do both? And, and, I, and I know we're kind of rare in doing this and, and melding together. And we're even taking a step further, almost putting like a third barbell on there and looking at some of the things like graphite and some of the commodities that go into this. So- we're capturing basically what I consider, Drew, the future of energy. This is the future of energy. We're looking at 5, 15, 20, 30 years. But we're doing yeah. it in so many different ways, diversifying our portfolio, lowering our risk, but still with huge, huge upside potential. Yeah, I mean, it's just the energy industry has changed a lot in recent years. I mean, if you think back, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, it just wasn't even in the conversation. It was still, you know, mainly just fossil fuels. And with the cost of all these products, I, I made the joke to you about, it's like buying a television. Like when you used to spend $5,000 for you know a small flat panel and now you can go get a brand new ultra high def, whatever TV for a thousand bucks. That's kind of what's happening right now with solar panels and with battery storage systems. Everything is getting more efficient, more you know well-designed and they're able to capture and store energy a lot better. So we're seeing this happen right in front of us and it's just, it's gonna take longer than people expect, but it is coming. And yep. you can see it in the numbers. So it makes a lot more sense to play both sides of the aisle, right? I mean, play 
on the dirty side of the barbell and have the clean too. You don't need to pick one or the other and yep. you can reduce your risk by doing both. So it makes the most sense. It does make sense. It's funny you mentioned TV. I sold a, a condo recently and the big flat screen was you know in the wall, hanging on the wall, one of those, those brackets. And I forgot to take it off. And the last day when I was closing, I was like, shoot, I don't have my tools with me. So I told the buyer, I said, do you want it? He goes, yeah, I guess I'll take it. And just literally just gave it to him. Like, because the, the effort it would have taken me to take it down because they're so damn cheap right now. I, but I probably paid quite a bit for it three or four years ago. But it's probably worth 150 bucks now. By the time you know it's four years old, it's not as cool anymore. But like, yeah, but you're seeing those price drops, which makes the you know these these new technologies economically viable for people to go out and buy an EV, for them to put solar panels on their house, for corporations to build little solar farms for their uh, industrial park or whatever it might be. We're now getting to a level that it makes actual sense. And as you mentioned, uh, with some of the you know rebates and, and, and incentives that you get with it. It makes it very attractive at that point. And I don't see that slowing down because uh, the government's pushing to get this net zero by 2050, which I don't think is possible, honestly. Um, I just don't see it happening that quickly. But they're going to try to because they want to live up to their word and they're going to spend a lot of our taxpayer money to try and achieve that. And that's global. That's not just here. That's all over the world. So well, anyway, Drew, um, thanks for coming on. We're going to bring you on every uh, couple months and jump into some of the more topics we're talking about. But I will say, you know, you and I have been working on this dirty, uh, clean barbell for a few months now. We've added some stocks, dirty and clean, to both of our portfolios. And uh, as we say or said in this week's issue, uh, expect more to come out. You know, we, had, we added a clean one this, this time, uh, but we could add some more dirty. When the opportunities arise in the market, uh, you know, you and the rest of the team and I will continue uh, to do our research and be ready for that. But this is a trend that I feel, and you'll probably agree, that we can continue to add stocks over the next couple of years because I think we're going to have a lot of great opportunities in that. Yeah, I don't think that this is a one or two year kind of thing. This is going to play out over years. And we talked about playing the picks and shovels type stocks that they're not necessarily the the companies that are responsible for the end result. You know, they're not going to be the one that is installing the solar panel itself, but maybe they supply all the parts that the solar panel needs. And that's a good way to invest in these types of trends because you're you're playing a part of it that you know is going to be part of the bigger picture trend. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have to pick the winner as much because you just have to pick the trend right. As long as the trend's yes. right, you're probably going to do very well with the picks and shovels, uh, which goes back to the gold rush days, which I've told that story a million times. You know, mm -hmm. People looking for gold didn't make money, but the guys selling the picks and shovels did pretty damn well. Uh, yeah, because exactly. everybody's out yep. there buying it. Yep. So, well, again, Drew, thanks so much for coming on. We'll have you back on again soon. Uh, talk about other exciting things uh, that we're working on. Uh, but until then, folks, thank you so much. Don't forget to like, comment, check out, uh, you know, the link there to check out our free daily. Anything more, ask us questions. We're always here for you. But again, I'm Matt McCall, and that was Making Money. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.